Hey guys, how you doing today? Nicholas, Nada, Amal, you guys are doing great. You guys come to every one of these bad boys, I think. <laughs> this is great. I'm proud of you. I'm glad you guys are uh, showing up for this. This is awesome. Hey guys, thanks for coming. I see a bunch of you are uh, checking in and coming into it and appreciate it. Hey, Brendan, what's up, man? Hey, Brendan, did you get that uh, college board thing taken care of? Hey, Carlisle. What's up, Jace? Hey, oh, Luke, what's going on, man? Babesh, what's up? Caden, how are you? I think everybody that's in here so far, not sure about you, Caden. Uh, I don't recall. Um, everybody that's in here that I can see, anybody that's popped up on the chat has sent me DBQs, which is great. Uh, yes, the AP exam is on May 21st. Um, hey, Samaya, how are you? Um, and I'm going to be talking a little bit about that here in just a few moments, just to make sure um, uh, we're all on the same page as that. Uh, let me do something first here. Nope, not that. Hey Cameron, how you doing today? Bishnu, what's going on? A couple more minutes and then we're going to get started. What's up, Tyler? Good afternoon. Man, Joe is not in here today asking me how many slides. Man, and I was even prepared for her today. I'm all right. 
right, Cameron, thank you for asking. It's uh, getting antsy for summer to begin. I'm getting antsy to get this thing uh, done. And I just, you know, want to get it going. All right. Kazi T, how long is this one? Um, I'm going to go through uh, four different units today, but they're all four very short. So I think total we're less than 20 slides today. So uh, I'm just going to hit a couple of I'm going to hit four of them today, 5.4 through 5.7. Um, and then on Friday, we just have three short ones to get through. So, um, you know. All right. Let's get going here. Um, one of the things that, well, first of all, thank you for coming, and I hope, um, you know, everyone is doing great. Uh, it's been uh, uh, kind of a weird week with all the rain that we've been getting at night and how nice it is during the day like today is. So I don't want to keep you, you know, too long. I know you've got other things going on and things like that. Uh, this was just sent to me uh, through College Board, what you see on the screen, and I have tried to send it out to you guys as well um you know but it's such a big document it wasn't attaching so i tried to share it with you through my google drive i don't know if that went through all right or not i know that link apparently is not working that i sent but if you look farther down on the email uh you should be able to see it and download it this is very very important for you to look at because it has several different things uh, that are very important for you to get ready for this exam. This exam is three weeks away for the AP World exam, exam. And I know some of you might be taking like calculus or AP bio or whatever, and those tests are probably sooner. So you need to be checking out this document and hopefully your other teachers are sending this out to you as well. Um, it breaks it down about your AP exam ticket here. You need to have a ticket that looks something, whoops, I keep putting my hand over the screen, sorry, um, that looks something like this. And this will be sent to you two days before the exam, all right? So you need to make sure you are getting emails from College Board, okay? I do not send this information out, College Board does. So you need to make sure to go into your College Board account Make sure that it's a working email. Don't use your uh, school provided email. Put a personal email in there, guys, and you should get something like this, all right? Um, and of course, it's only gonna be valid for that day of the test, okay? So please go through this document that I sent out, and if I get several uh, of you saying, hey, I didn't, I didn't get it, I will send it back out somewhere. I'll make sure you get it because it is very, very important that you have it. So again, uh, the AP exam is three weeks from tomorrow, all right? It's going to be here before we know it. All right, so uh, if you have questions on that, make sure uh, you ask in email. Um, you know, if I do a Zoom live thing, you can ask during that as well, all right? Okay, let's talk about on uh, Friday, the last time I lectured, we dealt with the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. And we know the Industrial Revolution doesn't just stay in one place, it spreads. So we're gonna take a look at how did different types and locations of production develop and change over time? That is the question that we're going to be asking here. Um, and of course, we know that uh, the Industrial Revolution begins in Great Britain, with it primarily with textile manufacturing. It always seems to start out with textile manufacturing, and then it morphs into iron manufacturing, then eventually steel, and then so on and so forth, and everything that is manufactured today. Um, and uh, with this textile factoring in Great Britain, uh, it replaces uh, the Indian and Middle Eastern goods, okay? Um, and that's what's gonna happen all across the world. We're gonna see these industrialized nations begin to use factories, and it's gonna take the manufacturing of certain products away from those different areas of the world, such as Egypt and India, especially when they were the ones that did um, primarily all the textile manufacturing, okay? Um, now, due to political turmoil in France and Spain, uh, 
and in Germany and these fragmented states that we have, industrialization occurs later than it happens in Great Britain. Great Britain, it starts approximately 1750 and eventually over the next two or three decades, it's going to spread across the rest of Europe and then of course into the United States. Um, areas where you had low population centers, industrialization didn't tend to spread as fast because that limited the amount of available workers. All right, by 1900, um, the leading industrial force in the world was due to uh, human capital. And that means you have a lot of people in this area of the world that led industrialization by 1900 was the United States because they had large enough cities on the East and West Coast um, and other areas of the world were experiencing political upheaval, uh, large amounts of, pop of poverty. So we have a lar the large number of immigrants coming to the United States through the East Coast and also the West Coast. So the United States becomes a major player in industrialization by 1900. Okay, um, now, does it happen, where else does it happen? It happens in Russia, of course. Uh, much later, they focus on railroads and exports. By 1900, uh, Russia had a railroad line, the Trans-Siberian Railroad here, that had you know connected 36,000 miles of railroad, and it connected commercial centers to industrial centers. Uh, it connected the Trans-Siberian Railroad, connected St. Petersburg all the way to the Pacific Ocean, as you see there in Vladivostok. Okay, and that allowed Russia for easy trading with East Asia, you know, China and Japan. Uh, by 1900, Russia was the fourth leading producer of steel. But again, even though they have that, the economy remains mostly agriculturally based here. Uh, Japan is the first Asian country to fully industrialize. Um, they had been isolated from Europe since the 1600s. And then, of course, uh, after Matthew Perry comes in in 1848, they begin to adapt European technology. Uh, they want to retain a little bit of their traditional culture. And by the second half of the 19th century, they do become a leading world power when we are talking, you know, industry wise. Let's see, where else? Shifts in manufacturing here. What else changes because of, uh, of um, manufacturing here? Shipbuilding sees a growth in India and Southeast Asia due to the political alliances that they have uh, with themselves and European nations. Of course, this is all due to uh, the early stages of imperialism and you know this interconnecting trade network that is being set up. And then, of course, any, any self-industrialization that some of these countries were doing on their own without European help would soon fall apart due to, you know, imperialism. Ships from the British Indian Company uh, became the Indian Navy, which was eventually disbanded by 1863 as the Brits took total control. Also due to British control, India's mineral production and the working of metal declined. Textile production in India and Egypt were stifled due to the British interference. You know, large numbers of British textile mills uh, severely cut uh, industrialization as it goes into, uh, you know, into Europe. So it cuts um, textile production out of India. It cuts textile production out of Egypt as well, and it becomes all British owned at that time. All right, so that was real quick on industrialization. And then our next topic here is going to be technology in the industrial age. And again, uh, these are very short uh, PowerPoints. And, uh, you know, I'm just going to give you a little bit of a break here. And uh, then we will start up and see if there's any questions that need to be answered here. Uh, yeah, I do too. Nicholas, I want school to end so we can uh, relax and not have to worry about this. But, you know, you think about it, this is kind of like what college is going to be like for you guys in a few years because you'll go to class and you have to figure out, you know, your own time management. That's what this is. Maybe this is better preparing you time management-wise as opposed to what we would normally do in school. Yeah, I told you, Bavesh, that was going to be quick. These are quick ones today. 
All right, so let's get going. Uh, technology in the industrial age. Um, and the question here is basically, how did technology shape economic production during this period? Because we go from the steam engine to internal combustion engines. We get electricity, we get you know the telegraph, we get all sorts of new technology due to the industrial revolution. You invent things because you really begin to figure out that uh, you, you need to do this sort of stuff. And one of the things here is what we call the coal uh, revolution here, all right? Um, James Watt, he is the inventor of the steam engine. And by 1765, he figures out a way to harness the energy of coal. All right, this helps with water transportation, bigger and faster ships. Uh, they revolutionize sailing. It's not much sailing anymore. It's all being powered by an engine of some sort. Uh, faster and larger equipment is being built. Coaling stations uh, are set up in critical points in the trading network because a lot of these ships, as they traveled across the open oceans, needed to have their coal resupplies. Hawaii was a coaling station or a fueling station for the United States. All right. Uh, Cape Colony down here in South uh, Africa, down here in this area, becomes a coaling station. Um, and also with coal, you get much more production of iron and then, of course, uh, the better quality product of steel much later on as, uh, the, Bessemer as the Bessemer process is invented as well. And then with this, we have the second industrial revolution. The first industrial revolution, of course, is manufacturing, you know, textiles and things of that nature, okay? Very basic factories. Well, in our second industrial revolution, we get the better production of steel, we get electricity, we get oil, uh, communications. Alexander Graham Bell invents the telephone uh, in 1876. And then you have uh, Marconi down here. He is able to send and receive a radio signal across the Atlantic Ocean by 1901. Guys, you think about this now, and we live in an era of the digital era where we bounce communication off satellites and things of that nature. What exactly am I doing here? I have Wi-Fi in my house, and you know it's going from my computer bouncing off some sort of a, of a receiver which is sending it out to a telephone line and which is bouncing it off a satellite somewhere and it's coming down to you. This is all a part of it. We take all this stuff for granted but it all stems from this era where the, the second industrial revolution comes from. Okay, moving on. All right, um, you know, as I said, the telegraph allows for faster communication. Because of the telegraph here, we get time zones, especially in the United States. You know, they follow along the railroad lines and the telegraph really helps with setting up time zones in the United States and then eventually across the world. Uh, the, trans not, the Transcontinental Railroad in the United States is built. It was completed in 1869. And this facilitates the growth of industry in the United States because it um, it connects commercial centers with resource centers for the first time in the ever expanding United States here. Uh, and the United States needs to have more resources as well. So they begin to establish colonies um, across the Pacific. And of course, we have the Navy to protect these resources and technology allows us to do that. Uh, it opens up exploration into the interiors of uh, places like you know, Africa, before in Africa, you know, the West Coast uh, African slave trade basically was the West Coast. As imperialism and technology continues, now they're able to build railroads in the interior and be able to access things in the interior of, of, um, of Africa. And that's where, you know, we're going to talk about uh, King Leopold II of Belgium, you know, later on, not today, uh, but uh, how he is able to access the Congo, you know, which is in this area of the world there to get all those uh, uh, rubber resources there. And then, of course, the more we have this technology, the more and more people begin to move across the world. And like I said, this is a very short one as well. So that's basic technology in the industrial age. 
What does it do to produce more industry and create uh, more trade and more migration? All right. So that ends that one. We got two more to go. And I assure you, it is just as short today. All right. And again, as you see, not even, you know, seven slides of information here in this last one. And then we are out for the day. Uh, would imperialism and the entrance of Europeans into Africa have not been possible without industrialization? Well, uh, Aman, it may not have been fully uh, possible, I mean, to get into the interior, but why do they go and imperialize? Because they need resources to uh, fuel their manufacturing. So I think imperialism and industrialization, you know, go hand in hand. Maybe you don't need imperialism if you don't industrialize because uh, the idea of what... Uh, the Europeans the Europeans did for imperialism was to greatly enhance their economic production. So imperialism and uh, industrialization definitely go hand in hand here. Yeah, uh, Nicholas, that's a good answer. The industrialization just most likely caused an exponential growth of power for the Europeans there due to uh, industrialization and imperialization. Hmm. Again, guys, if you haven't written that last uh, DBQ um, about the Mongols, please do so. Um, I'm seeing a lot of improvement in your writing over the last, you know, three weeks. And I think it helps that we continue to practice. Um, you know, I know there are, uh, you know, schools out there that aren't practicing full DBQs. And I think we will be well ahead of the game if we keep practicing that. Also, um, start you know, putting together, you know, cheat sheets or review sheets that you can have sitting beside you during, during you, while you write. So that way you can bring out those uh, contextualization paragraphs. Uh, and I see a lot of great contextualization paragraphs being written. Thesis statements are really on point, guys. I'm really proud of you for doing that and how you're creating your uh, argumentation. So please read the one that I sent out. Um, you know, the perfect essay from a kid from that, you know, from our class. And, uh, and I've sent out, you know, these perfect scores and they've been by three different students. So it can happen if you set things up right. All right. Okay. Let's get into, you know, what did government do? What was their role in industrialization? Let me get into my phone here. Okay. All right, here we go. So the question here is, what economic strategies did different states and empires adopt? And what were the causes and effects of those strategies? All right, so nations react differently to industrialization. They all don't act the same. All right, some industrialize to try to keep a hold of traditional values. And as some, you know, uh, industrialized, some got left behind because they didn't industrialize. All right. Um, uh, let's see here. There we go. Okay. So even though that the Ottomans, the sick man of Europe, I saw someone use that term in their essay yesterday, uh, and they got, uh, you know, extra credit for it. I was, or it was in their belief system essay. That's what it was. And they used the sick man, you know, line, and it was perfect. Um, and uh, it got evidence beyond document there. So even though that the Ottomans uh, bordered Europe, they took forever to adopt any Western technology or Enlightenment ideas. That doesn't happen till the second half under the Tanzimat era, uh, you know, of the of the 19th century. And then again, it really it really doesn't help them out there. Um, in China, the Qing government 
basically too weak here. Uh, they were split into spheres of influence. You have the Opium Wars going on. You have the Taiping and Boxer Rebellion. So stability in government is key to industrialization. And these governments here, the Ottomans and the Chinese, do not react too well. And thus, industrialization is very, very slow in these areas. Now, in Egypt, a little bit different things happen here. They are a part of the Ottoman Empire, all right? The Sultan really doesn't have a whole lot of power in Egypt, though. They're able to assert their own control. Um, and that's kind of weird for an empire to let a province or a state or whatever you want to call it exert this much control as Egypt did. Uh, the Ottomans try to assert more control. They send in their army and they are beaten and they fail. And uh, you get the rise of a guy by the name of Muhammad Ali here. He's the guy on the left here. Um, and he begins to act more independently with no problems from the Sultan. The Sultan of the Ottoman Empire just basically says, hey, you know, just do your own thing. You know, you're good here. So he begins his own reforms. And of course, when you reform, you reform the military and it's based on, you know, Western ideas, what comes from Europe. Now, in Egypt, it's a little bit different than what happens in Europe. It is state-sponsored industrialization. Government takes control of cotton production. They're the ones to build the textile factories to compete with the British and the French. They build the ships. Um, you know, then there all is state-sponsored or state-controlled. All right, and uh, Muhammad Ali here is considered one of the first great. Uh, rulers of Egypt in the modern day because of his vision. All right, in Japan, let's take a look at this one. This one's a little bit, a little bit more extensive here. Um, you think you got to remember is that Japan had been isolated for about 250 years when they kicked the foreign devils out, those Christian missionaries around 1600. And then about 1853, I think I had my year right or wrong earlier. I think I said 1848 when Matthew Perry comes in. It's actually 1853. He rolls in um, to Tokyo Bay to set up a trade agreement. He comes in these big uh, iron ships that the black smoke is rolling out of. So they're called the black ships and Japan just kind of freaks out a little bit. They realize they might be in danger of being left behind and also they understood how China was reacting to Western influences. So they act differently. They don't want to have unequal trade agreements set up like China had. Uh, so they overthrow the shogunate and they establish what is called the Meiji Restoration. The Meiji Restoration completely changes how government is approached, how economics is approached. Now, they don't get rid of all of the old ways, but they are not as important as they once were under the, you know, under the shogunates. They abolish feudalism in 1868. They set up a constitutional monarchy based on the Prussian model here, where the emperor ruled through a political leader. Remember, the emperor in Japan is more of a figurehead. He's more of a puppet. He is respected as more of like a god or a pope, but he really does not have any political power. All right, you have equality before the law. They reorganized the military and they based it on the Western model. New Navy, new school systems, expanded technological fields. They built railroads and regular roads as well. Um, and when they would industrialize, the government would subsidize, the government would pay for the building of factories that uh, produced, you know, things like tea and silk and weaponry and shipbuilding and rice wine and things like that. Um, so initially, the Japanese government during this industrial revolution were the ones that sponsored industrialization. Very different than what happens in Great Britain where it is all based on private ownership and capitalism. Same way in the United States. Private ownership, capitalism, okay? And then just like in Western uh, industrialization, uh, female workers were exploited just like they were in Great Britain. Um, and once a business was flourishing, once the government had a corporation, not a corporation, a factory up and running, the government would then sell the business to powerful Japanese family business or to powerful 
Japanese family business organizations, and they were called Zaibatsu. All right, they were wealthy, they were entrepreneurs, and then it became a private industry without much government interference. Um, for instance, a carpenter in Japan founded a company in 1906 called the Toyota Loom Works. Okay, what did this guy make? He made an automatic loom, and what this loom does is textiles. But then, of course, through the next century, it would become known as the Toyota Motor Company. So the Toyota Motor Company was established by a carpenter back in 1906, okay? And it wasn't even initially set up to build uh, high-tech uh, things for like cars and trucks and whatever else Toyota does, motorcycles and things of that nature. And that brings us to the end of what government's role is. Government is fully involved in some of those areas, like it was in Japan and Egypt. Uh, they're not involved at all, like in the Ottomans and in, uh, um, what was the other one, uh, and China. But, uh, and then of course they didn't even support private ownership. But then, like in Great Britain and the United States, it was very capitalistic, hands-off, we'll kind of regulate it, but we're not going to tell you what to do and what you can build and things like that. So government's role is very, very different depending on where you are. All right. So we're going to head into the last one, which is economic developments and innovations. I'm going to kind of give you a uh, break here for uh, a moment. All right. Yeah, Bavesh, I highly, um, I highly suggest any of you to watch uh, Heimler's history. Uh, I've provided you with links in those uh, study guides that I have sent or that I have put in Canvas. So please take a look at his at his videos as well. He does a really nice job. All right. Uh, let me see. Jesse, that's pretty well, I got one. Oh yeah, congratulations, Jesse. Don't get cocky. The next one might be more rougher. All right. So not a problem. It was a great essay. Yeah, Daniel, your car did originate from a loom company. That's kind of the weird thing thinking about that. How does the Japanese industrialization compare to Russia's? Uh, the Japanese, uh, let me see who is that, Monica. Uh, the Japanese uh, government was fully involved with uh, setting it up and they would, they would set up the factory and then later on they would, um, you know, sell it to one of those Zaibatsu families. So initially very involved at the end when it was up and running, they would take, they would, they would sell it to get it off their hands so they can concentrate on something else. In Russia, remember, we're under an autocratic government, very uh, uh, a monarch, an absolute monarch. They tried to industrialize, uh, but it didn't work out that well with industrialization in Russia. I mean, they built railroads and they were big into ironworks, but it was primarily a agriculturally based country. So it didn't fully industrialize until much later. And then when we get into the communist era in the, uh, you know, in the 20th century. <laughs> I just did answer. <laughs> All right. Okay. Let's, uh, hey, I don't want to slam Jesse. I'm just saying, you know what? Don't always count on that really good score. It was. It was a good essay that he wrote. He even bragged about it in the email he sent me. He says, I think this is my best one yet. Do, 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 do. All right. But yeah, it was good. It was good. All right. Let's get this finished out. It's only 2.30 and I'm really happy that I'm you know getting through this pretty fast today. Um, so economic developments and innovations. All right. Um, so how did development and economic system ideologies and institutions contribute to this change, all right? Because we have to have a way of thinking when we go into this, all right? Uh, there we go, all right. You know, the idea of mercantilism, that's an economic system ideology. It's replaced by capitalism. That is an economic system ideology. How did that contribute to this change and into this innovation in this time period. All right, so let's get into that here. And again, this is not very long at all, but uh, I you know, just wanna make sure we cover all this. So effects on business organization here. Um, 
manufacturers, what they would do here, uh, they would create these giant corporations. And a corporation is basically stockholders invest into these corporations. And it minimizes risk. Not one person is responsible for this whole multi-billion dollar corporation. For me, for instance, and your parents do the same thing. They buy stocks. And what they do, I have like, you know, 400 Walmart stocks. Okay. I used to work for the Walmart company. And while I was there, I bought stock. And I, in a sense, own 400 stocks of the Walmart company. Now, there's millions of stocks out there. I just own 400. And I have made money on those stocks. Now, if Walmart goes, you know, out of business, I lose my initial investment in that company. All right. So that's the risk I take. But we start to see these giant corporations start to uh, form. Also, monopolies begin to form. And uh, a monopoly is formed to eliminate all competition. If you play the game of Monopoly, it's very, very similar. You try to get control of all those streets. Um, and in business, you try to get a hold of all of the factories and the businesses that work for your factory. So if you're a car manufacturer, you want to own the coal mine. You want to own the steel factories. You want to own the rubber production. You want to own the rubber facilities. You want to get all of, you want to get control of everything that is needed to build your product. And if you do that, you can make a ton of money because it reduces your cost. You know, you get transnational companies for the first time. Uh, De Beers Diamond Company, uh, Hong Kong and Shanghai Banking, they do all this international business during this time. You know, investments and global banking and insurance companies start to build. Coca-Cola, for instance, is a multinational corporation. It is everywhere, all over the world. So you start to see this growth in these types of corporations in the world. All right. And what types of effects does it have on mass culture? All right. You get what is called consumerism. Hey, I see a really cool washing machine I want to go buy. I want to buy this car or this bicycle here. You start to see people with extra cash. They can actually go and do things because they have extra money. And of course, this is the middle class, the working class. Not so much, but the middle class begins to be able to go to plays, they begin to go to sporting events, baseball games, popular culture, parks are being built to accommodate this wide range of social classes here. People can afford uh, cars and bikes and culture and things like that. And with mass consumerism, you get mass advertising, you know. Mass advertising is a pop-up ad that you see on your social media site, all right? It's an ad in the newspaper. It's, you know, watching Hulu, and then it breaks for 90 seconds of commercials. That's mass advertising, okay? And we see the beginnings of that <clears throat> due to this effect on mass culture, the want and need to make money. All right, guys. That ends it for uh, today, where we've just kind of discussed, you know, industrialization spreads, how do governments work, and, uh, and then how did economic developments and innovations work, okay? Um, you know, just a couple of things before I get out of here today. Uh, I just want to make sure that, uh, you know, everyone are getting my emails that are being sent. Take a look at those attachments, especially the ones that I sent out today. Those are very, very important, especially as it comes down to, um, you know, three weeks from tomorrow where uh, we will be, um, you know, taking the AP exam. All right. Um, okay. So that's it for today, guys. Uh, we'll do this again. We'll finish up Unit 5 on Friday. And then on Monday, of course, we will do another bit of writing. So if you haven't uh, done any of your writing, um, you know, make sure I get to see something and uh, I will definitely grade it and send it back to you. All right, guys, I'm out. Be good. Take care. 